Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, dedicated to informing residents about healthcare topics and issues. Through programs featuring community forums and free health and wellness classes, our goal is to empower community members with the information needed to make informed health decisions. Washington Hospital has been providing health care to the residents of the Washington Township Healthcare District for the past 60 years. Today's presenter is Dr. Jalriza Mansuri. Dr. Mansuri is a board-certified OBGYN. She is also a member of the Washington Township Medical Foundation. So our topic today is endometriosis, its causes, the symptoms, and how to diagnose it, as well as the treatments. Again, so just to kind of go over what we're going to talk about, endometriosis is sort of a very personal topic for many women especially generally, generationally, some women, especially the older ones that may have it, are kind of very reluctant to discuss it with their physician. So this is just one way to kind of get us to open, more about, open up more about it and learn more about this condition. So the goals of our talk today are to de define what endometriosis is, kind of discuss some theories of how or what causes endometriosis, what are the signs and symptoms of endometriosis, what are the techniques we use to diagnose it, and how do we treat it. So hopefully we'll, we'll cover all of that in a timely manner. So what is endometriosis? Before we can really talk about endometriosis, we have to talk about something most women normally have, which is endometrial tissue. Inside our uterus, lining the cavity of the uterus, is tissue called an endometrium. This is what normally thickens up during your menstrual cycle to prepare for a pregnancy. Uh, it does this in response to your own body's estrogen production. If a woman does not get pregnant, she then bleeds this lining out in the form of a period. So endometriosis is basically a matter of location. It's endometrial tissue, which we normally have in the endometrial cavity, but it's endometrial tissue that's outside of the uterine cavity. This endometrial tissue can implant on other areas of the pelvis and it becomes inflamed, it can bleed, it can activate pain receptors in response to our own estrogen production. It's hard to really know the prevalence of endometriosis, but in women who have chronic pelvic pain, it's, it can be as high as 30 to 40%. The reason why it's a little hard to determine an exact number for the prevalence of endometriosis in our female population is because some women may have endometriosis, but they may not have any symptoms. And so they'll never necessarily go to their physician for evaluation or be diagnosed with it. So, when the endometrial tissue implants, the common areas for where it can show up in the pelvis or in the body are usually closer to where the uterus is, so closer to the uterus. So these areas from most common to least are the ovaries. Naturally, the ovaries are right next to those fallopian tubes or the openings of the fallopian tubes. The anterior and posterior cul-de-sac of the pelvis, these are the pockets or of spaces in front of the uterus and behind the uterus. Can, they can also show up on the uterosacral ligaments. These are ligaments sort of near the cervix and in the back of the uterus that help to support our uterus. Of course, they can show up on the surface or the outside of the uterus, as well as the fallopian tubes. Now, endometriosis is not just specific to our pelvic structures or, or our reproductive organs. Endometrial implants can also develop or show up on our other parts of our ab abdominal cavity, such as on our sigmoid colon or intestines, on our appendix. They can show up sometimes even on more distant areas like our anterior abdominal wall. We often may see this in women that have had surgeries, for example, a cesarean section. And so uh, endometrial tissue can implant into the scar of that surgery and develop into an abdominal mass. And endometriosis can occur even further away than the abdominal cavity. It can appear even in the lungs or the brain, but these two examples are very rare. On the photo there is just sort of a stylized drawing of the female pelvis. The really pink structure is the uterus, behind it is the colon, in front of it is the bladder, and this is just showing you, the red dots are just showing you the multiple areas where endometriosis can develop. 
So what causes endometriosis? There are several theories that are out there. The first theory is one of what we call retrograde menstruation. So this is a process where instead of the period blood or the endometrial tissue that's been shed, leaving the body through the cervix and the vagina, it, it, it goes backwards where it flows through the fallopian tubes and out of the openings of the fallopian tubes into the pelvic cavity. One of the findings that kind of supports this theory is that young women who have a congenital anomaly of the uterus where their uterine cavity is closed off and there's no way for the endometrial tissue to be shed and leave through the cervix, they have a higher rate of endometriosis because they, they, there's nowhere else for that blood to go but potentially backwards through the fallopian tubes into the pelvic cavity. But one of the other things that I've read through my research is that about 90% of women actually do have some amount of retrograde menstrual flow, but not all of them are, you know, develop endometriosis. Another possible uh, source is from stem cells. So we do have cells in our body, pockets of cells, that may be remnants of multipotent cells uh, that we develop in the embryonic stage when we're still developing in our mother's womb. So these cells have the potential to become other tissues. And so there are certain types of cells that we have that are again remnants of what we may have uh, developed or had when we were growing in our mother's womb. And these particular cells are called malarian cells, bone marrow cells, or even embryonic pockets of, again, cells that we had when we were developing in the womb. These cells may already exist outside of the uterus and can develop into endometriosis. And then there also is the theory of endometrial cells spreading from the uterus through the bloodstream and the lymphatic system. The third theory would kind of explain why some patients, very rarely, but why some patients can get endometriosis in their brains or their lungs. Again, those two, those two examples are, are very rare. So what are the signs and symptoms of endometriosis? So the endometriosis is interesting in that the severity of the actual disease, how many implants we have, where they are, don't really coincide with our symptoms. We'll have patients who have very severe symptoms and not have very much endometriosis disease in their pelvis and vice versa. But typically when we do see our patients in the clinic, these are the types of symptoms that the patients will complain about that may have it. So dysmenorrhea, we all know this as women, <laughs> it's the pain we get with our periods, the dull, crampy pelvic pain. Usually it begins several days before the period, lasts through the period, and for several days after which is pretty frustrating because that basically takes up two weeks of your menstrual cycle of your month. Then there's dyspareunia. This is pain that occurs with vaginal intercourse. For women who have pain all the time, we then characterize them as having chronic pelvic pain. And it's been described with anywhere from words such as dull, throbbing, sharp, or burning. Another manifestation of endometriosis are abnormal periods, especially periods that are heavier than usual in flow. Because our pelvic structures are very low, we can, in, in our pelvis, in our abdomen, endometriosis, especially if it's occurring towards the back of our body or near our rectum, can manifest as lower back pain. And understandably, many diseases that cause chronic pain can cause that particular patient to have chronic fatigue. Pain, pain is very tiresome. So that's also a, a common symptom. Also, endometriosis has different symptoms based on where they implant. So if, if the endometriosis implants are on the bowel, it can cause diarrhea, constipation, blood and stool. It can cause pain with defecation. If the endometriosis is on the bladder, it can actually mimic a urinary tract infection. You can have symptoms such as increased urinary frequency and pain with urination. 
And that's why, just as an aside, for patients who are having symptoms that they think might be a urinary tract infection, we do recommend that you be seen in clinic because it may not be a urinary tract infection. It might be something else, and we'd hate to just give you antibiotics if not warranted. Um, so now to get back to the talk. <laughs> so endometriosis can also appear on the ureters. The ureters are these tubes that bring urine from the kidneys down to the bladder. And if it shows up on your ureters and you know they become inflamed, they can cause a colicky upper back or side pain. And also it can cause you to have blood in your urine. So definitely for anybody who ever has blood in their urine, that is not normal. You wanna be seen by your physician, okay? Endometriosis, again, that appears on the anterior abdominal wall, as we had mentioned earlier, can present as a painful mass. And sometimes it can bleed. And the bleeding oftentimes tends to coincide with the menstrual cycles or the period. Endometriosis that shows up in the lungs or the chest cavity can present as chest pain, lung collapse, or what we call pneumothorax. And also patients can have coughing up of blood. Another way that endometriosis presents, if not with pain, is with infertility or reduced fertility. Endometriosis, as you know, when the implant on the pelvic structures, oftentimes with repeated inflammation and scarring, will cause the pelvic anatomy, the uterus, the fallopian tubes, the ovaries, to potentially scar together, and also to scar to surrounding tissues, like the lining of our abdominal cavity, as well as our bowel. When this happens, when our anatomy is distorted, it does make it more difficult to get pregnant. Another thing that happens is every time the uh, implants become inflamed, they trigger the immune system, they bleed. This whole inflammatory process makes it very difficult for the ovaries to function. So it makes it difficult for ovulation, fertilization, and even implantation of an embryo to occur. In one particular study of 1,000 women who were confirmed to have endometriosis, 25% of them actually presented to their physician with infertility as opposed to pain. And through my readings, and just based on my stock knowledge you know, of having had patients with this condition, if you were to look at a population of women undergoing treatment with a, for infertility, with reproductive endocrinology and infertility specialty clinics, up to 40% of them will have endometriosis. So it really does impact a, a woman's reproductive function. Another sign of endometriosis is something a little bit more obvious, is an endometrioma. This is more commonly known as a chocolate cyst. So this occurs when endometrial tissue implants within the ovary. And then of course, with, in response to estrogen, it undergoes inflammation, it bleeds, it releases inflammatory enzymes, and all of these substances stay within the ovary. It, has, it can't leave, it's stuck inside the ovary, and so it just keeps collecting in a cyst. And so it basically forms like a little water balloon, but instead of containing water, it contains old blood and inflammatory material. And it, the contents actually looks like Hershey's chocolate syrup. And that's why it's, it's more common. Our layman's name is a chocolate cyst. And about 30 to 40% of women with endometriosis are gonna have an endometrioma. An endometrioma is a benign cyst. So if you look at the picture over there, the pink structure is the uterus, and the structure to the, the left of that is the endometrioma. And in this particular case, that endometrioma is larger than the top of that uterus. Fibroids are a different structure. So fibroids are a monoclonal tumor of the smooth muscle of the uterus. So they usually develop from the uterine muscle, so more from the pink structure. It doesn't necessarily accumulate with, with blood, but it is muscle tissue and it feels more like a rubber ball or even a boiled egg. They can't, it can, having multiple fibroids, as well as if the fibroids are within the uterine cavity, that can cause heavy bleeding and painful bleeding. So how do we diagnose endometriosis? So 
When we have a patient who comes in with a constellation of symptoms or signs that we just discussed, one of the first things we have to do, of course, is a thorough review of their medical and surgical history, as well as do a basic physical exam. It's important to do the medical history because we want to sort of get details about the individual's pain, how long they've had it, the severity, where they're feeling the pain, what types of diagnostic procedures were already done and what types of treatments they've already had. And it's very important to get a good or, or very clear surgical history from the patient because one of the treatments of endometriosis is actually surgery. So when we're evaluating patients, the three most common symptoms patients will report, the trifecta of symptoms, would be abdominal pelvic pain, dysmenorrhea, or painful periods, as well as heavy menstrual bleeding, so heavier flow with the periods. Some of the common findings are on exam are tenderness on the vaginal exam. So for the women, they know this exam. For the men, they may not know. So part of a pelvic exam is what we call a bimanual exam. And this is when we put two fingers on the vagina to put pressure on the cervix, and we push down on the uterus, as well as the surrounding uh, adnexal areas. And the adnexa are the areas to the sides of the uterus where the ovaries and fallopian tubes would be. So with pressing on those areas, oftentimes women with endometriosis will have tenderness over the uterus or the sides of the uterus where the ovaries are. One of the other findings is sometimes we'll actually feel nodules through the vaginal mucosa, if there are any endometriosis lesions that have made it f as far down as the vagina. Of course, an adnexal cyst or a, a, an ovarian cyst would be a clue telling us that a patient might have an endometrioma or a chocolate cyst. Another thing that can happen sometimes, instead of the uterus being sort of up and down, is the uterus can kind of be tilted more to one side or the other. It's kind of rare, but every now and then if a patient has an endometrial implant that has actually shown up on the surface of the cervix or the surface of the, the deep vagina, then that would be an indication also of an endometriosis. Now in terms of laboratory tests, and I'm talking about blood tests that we could do, there really aren't any good markers. There are some markers that are being studied and are experimental but aren't really available for use by physicians or by the, the medical community. I have CA-125 there. So CA-125 is cancer antigen 125. You may have heard of it because it is one of the markers we look at when we're trying to evaluate a woman who might have ovarian cancer. It's also a marker used to monitor women who have ovarian cancer and are being treated with chemotherapy or radiation to see if they're getting better from the ovarian cancer. CA-125, though, is not a very specific marker. It actually increases in inflammatory conditions. So sometimes in women that have endometriosis, their CA-125 can be very elevated. Other things that can elevate CA-125 is, for example, pelvic inflammatory disease or a pelvic infection. So not very specific. It's not necessarily something we'd get automatically when we're evaluating a patient for possible endometriosis. So we know that the endometriosis implants, they, they will act similarly to our own endometrial tissue inside our uterine cavity. So one of the things that we can get as women is uterine cancer or endometrial cancer, where there's over thickening of that lining and then cancer can develop. So it, it, the implants have that potential and have sometimes have shown changes that mimic that process within the endometrium. But we, it's really something we, should, we need to study more. Well, the average time actually for diagnosis from the onset of symptoms to diagnosis of endometriosis is about seven years. So that's a good point because women, many women live with the symptoms and, and don't realize that this is a possible diagnosis for them. So what about imaging studies? And whenever we're evaluating a, a patient, a female patient, for any kind of reproductive, possible reproductive problem, our first go-to imaging study is a pelvic ultrasound. And typically this is done transvaginally because you're getting closer to the organs you need to look at. You do it abdominally through the abdomen. You, you need to go through skin, fat, fascia, muscle. Just a little harder to see things. So this is 
particularly specifically a pelvic ultrasound done through the vagina. This type, th this is the one of the more helpful imaging studies for endometriosis. If an endometrioma, for example, is seen, that is diagnostic for endometriosis. Sometimes you'll actually be able to see nodules. So if the endometrial implants are large enough and they're collecting enough that blood and inflammatory material, you might even be able to see nodules on an ultrasound. So this is the image to the left is actually a picture of what an endometrioma looks like. The image to the right shows endometrioma <laughs> implants look like. There are a couple of dark areas to the right of the endometrioma that are actually implants. Now, unfortunately, the most definitive diagnosis or the most definitive way to uh, confirm the diagnosis of endometriosis is through surgery. So basically a surgery where we can see the implants, biopsy the implants, and then send it to pathology for a histologic diagnosis. Surgery that we do is typically done through what we call laparoscopy. So this is a type of surgery where we make very small incisions in the abdomen and pelvis, and we use long pencil-thin instruments, which includes a camera, to examine the pelvic cavity. So if you look at the picture on top, that's sort of a stylized picture of a person undergoing laparoscopy, and you can see small incisions and those long instruments going into the pelvis. The the picture on the bottom actually shows what endometriosis implants look like when we are doing this type of surgery. Now, not every patient may want to undergo surgery. There are definitely risks to surgery, such as infection, bleeding, injury, and sometimes it may not be safe for a patient to undergo surgery. They may have other illnesses, diseases that make it a little bit more risky to do a procedure. So there are non-surgical ways to definitively diagnose endometriosis. One of the ones I said earlier is basically the presence of an endometrioma. If there's an endometrioma, you have endometriosis. Sometimes if a patient has a lesion, again, that has shown up on the, the, the mucosal side of the vagina, or the side we can see when we're doing a pelvic exam, then we can biopsy that and send it to pathology. There is also procedure called cystoscopy, which is basically using a camera to look inside the bladder. And if endometriosis implants are found inside the bladder, it can also be biopsied and sent to pathology for confirmation that it's endometriosis. If on pelvic exam, a rectovaginal exam is done, I know this sounds gruesome, but it's, a, it's an exam where we're uh, feeling the, the bottom or the posterior wall of the vagina as well as through the rectum. If we feel nodules there and you also see nodules on an ultrasound that was done concomitantly, then that also tells you, yes, that is endometriosis. But you don't always need to do surgery or have a histological diagnosis or, or a, a biopsy to confirm before you start treatment. If a, if a patient has the signs, the symptoms, and there are ultrasound findings that tell you this is endometriosis, you can make a presumptive non-surgical diagnosis and initiate treatment. So doing surgery is not necessary to initiate treatment. We, we have a saying in medicine when I was going to medical school uh, about making a diagnosis on an illness. So we used to say, if somebody looks like Aunt Minnie, sounds like Aunt Minnie, and smells like Aunt Minnie, it's Aunt Minnie. <laughs> so how do we treat endometriosis? Now this is a difficult one, as our, our guest has explained. The treatment is still, still very difficult. <laughs> so the American Society of Reproductive Medicine put out a, a statement that they'd like us to use, that endometriosis is a chronic disease that requires a lifelong treatment plan. And the plan depends on the individual and what their goals are in life, as well as how they're presenting and what their symptoms are. So we, we would tailor the treatments based on how bad their symptoms are, if they have pain or not. Because, because like I said, a good percentage of women, that may not be their presenting symptom. In, in fertility, so some women have the goal of wanting to conceive, and so certain treatments are not really appropriate for them. 
It also depends on the disease extent and location. So endometriosis actually has a grading system in terms of the amount, location, and amount of scarring that the implants have caused. And they go from grades one through grades four. So the, this type, the, the grading of the disease would also guide the kind of treatment that needs to be done. The patient age, if the patient is at the end of their reproductive life and have no desire for children, that would also guide what kind of, what kind of treatment could be done. The medications that we do offer have side effects, so it depends also on the, how well patients can tolerate side effects or whether they have any or not. And some treatments are not available to certain populations, and so that can also limit the, the treatments that we do or de determine the treatments that we do. So, so let's get started on the treatment. <laughs> For patients that have mild to moderate pain, this is sort of defined loosely as patients or women who don't have any absences or regular absences for school, uh, with, from school or work from the pain. The first line of treatment, believe it or not, is NSAIDs. So ibuprofen, Motrin, Advil, Naproxen, Celebrex. There's not really a really strict randomized controlled trial that tells us this works but it's, it has a low side effect profile. There's low risk of use compared to other medications we have. It's cheap, it's affordable, and we do know that it is effective in treating painful periods. So dysmenorrhea, or painful periods, with or without endometriosis, we do know it is uh, successfully treated with Motrin or ibuprofen. And the other benefit of ibuprofen is it can be used even if you're trying to get pregnant. The only exception though is Celebrex, which to be honest with you, we don't use that often in OBGYN anyway, but it, the reason why is because it can delay ovulation for women who are trying to conceive. Now the next sort of bastion of treatment that we do use very commonly are combined oral contraceptives. These have been found in studies to be effective in treating uh, endometriosis pain. And there are some studies, although this is sort of on the fence because not all studies show this, but there are some studies that show that combined oral contraceptive or birth control pill can retard the progression or slow the progression of endometriosis. The, also, the other benefit is if a patient is not wanting to get pregnant, it also provides their birth control. Now, whenever we're talking about the combined oral contraceptives, these are the birth control pills that contain both an estrogen and a progesterone. Some birth control pills don't have any progesterone, so this contains a, an estrogen and a progestin. It comes in multiple patches, so it, does, it can tailor to a patient's needs or desires in terms of how they use a the medication. It comes in the pill form, of course, which we're all very familiar with. It comes in a weekly patch form, as well as a vaginal ring that could be used kept in place for 21 days or three weeks. Birth control, we know, and we've seen this in our population, we've been able to use it safely for the long term. And it, one of the things also that a combined estrogen progesterone birth control pill does, it actually decreases our risk for ovarian cancer and endometrial cancer. So sort of an added side benefit. Two ways to use it, which I think a, I, we started doing it when I was a resident, is the birth control pills comes in a 28-day pack. The last seven days are sugar pills. They don't have any hormones in them. And that's to allow a woman to, or, to have a withdrawal bleed. And you can actually refrain from taking the withdrawal week and just keep taking pills that have the, the drug in them. So you throw, throw away that pack after 21 days and start a new pack. This is what we call a continuous regimen. In this manner, then, you don't have that decrease in hormones that brings about that period or that withdrawal bleed. And it can also be used typically. It doesn't have to be the, the continuous regimen. But we do know that the continuous regimen does potentially treat the endometriosis a little bit better. Now, I, as I mentioned earlier, birth control pills Hormonal contraception also comes in a progestin-only contraceptive. So progestin is the synthetic form of progesterone, our, pre our pregnancy hormone, the hormone we make when we're pregnant. 
and it can be used in place of an oral contraceptive, especially if a patient is not a good candidate for estrogen because estrogen is not 100% safe. Any estrogen we take, whether in birth control or for hormone replacement therapy, does increase your chance for clot formation, so forming a deep vein thrombosis or even a pulmonary embolism. So the common forms of it, kind of scientific geek terms, are norethindrone acetate, that's otherwise known as agestin. There's also medroxyprogesterone acetate, which comes in a pill as well as a shot. And many of you may have heard this. It's called Depo-Provera. It's a, an injection of hormone that you can get every three months. So it's nice in that you don't have to take a pill every day. The other benefit of progestins, because we didn't really talk about this, the NSAIDs help treat the pain, but they don't reverse the process. But the progestin can inhibit the endometriotic growths, the endometriosis implants from getting worse. It can also potentially cause the endometrial implants to atrophy. That's just a scientific term for get smaller, thinner. Yeah, shrinks them down, exactly. It also inhibits our pituitary stimulation or our own production of our ovarian estrogen and progesterone. So one of the themes that you'll notice is that these are the first the, the second and third medication we're talking about are medications that will reduce our own body's production of estrogen because the endometriosis implants are very estrogen dependent. And again, because it doesn't have the estrogen, it's a little bit safe. It has a little safer profile in terms of forming clots in your veins. But like everything else we have in medicine, everything has side effects. So one of the side effects of progestin-only birth control pill is it can cause irregular bleeding or unscheduled bleeding. It can cause you to not have a period at all sometimes while you're on the medication. It can cause weight, it is associated, especially more so the shot than the other forms of progesterone. More specifically for the Depo-Provera, it can cause weight gain or mood changes. So progestin-only contraceptives also come into two other long-acting forms, which are actually very popular forms of birth control in our, in our ladies who are within their reproductive years. One is called Nexplanon, which is basically a four centimeter long plastic rod that contains the medication in it. It goes right underneath the skin. It's something we can place in clinic and it slowly releases a progestin hormone over three years. And then there's the progestin-releasing intrauterine device, or IUD. This is, the benefit of this is the amount of estrogen you get in your, or progesterone, sorry, you get in your bloodstream is a little bit lower. The majority of that hormone stays within the vicinity of the, your uterus and pelvic structures. The common brand names we have available are Mirena, Kylina, and Skyla. Now for moderate to severe pain, these are for those unfortunate ladies that do miss work, that are impacted, their function, their daily functioning are, is impacted by their, their pain. One is called gonadotropin releasing hormone. We can just call it GNRH, agonist. So this is a chemical that likes to attach to GNRH receptors. It blocks the, those receptors so that our own GNRH cannot reach those receptors. Basically, the short, the the punchline to this medication is that it also decreases our own body's production of estrogen. The common brand names that we have in the United States are Lupron, which is I think the more oral form of it, and Depo-Lupron, which is also an injection that could be given monthly as well as every three months. So Depo-Lupron has been shown to be more effective than other treatments. It, it down, again down regulates her production of N estrogen it can also cause the endometriosis implants to shrink, but basically what it's doing is it's putting us into chemical menopause. So for the ladies that are you know, expected to have their usual or to, you know, with, are within the age of having normal estrogen produ produ uh, production, it can cause symptoms of menopause such as hot flashes, vaginal dryness, decreased libido, mood swings, headaches even more scary is decreasing their bone density if you use it for a prolonged period. So if you take a 30-year-old woman who has severe endometriosis and put them on Depo-Lupron, it's like they're, they're getting a sneak peek of what it's gonna be like when they hit 50, 51, which is the average age of menopause. 
So sometimes we mitigate these side effects by giving back a little bit of hormone. So typically it's either giving back or giving a woman a little bit of a progestin only birth control or a combined oral contraceptive. Now this one's a little bit more confusing. So the first one was a GNRH agonist. It, it likes to goes onto the receptors and it acts kind of like GNRH, but not in the same way. But this one actually just prevents, completely antagonizes the ability of GNRH to go onto the receptor. So again, punchline, it decreases our body's production of estrogen. It does work immediately, and the benefit of this particular medication is it comes in both an oral and an injectable forms. Some patients don't like needles. I don't blame them, I don't like them either. So this is one that comes in an oral form, and the dose can be adjusted to minimize symptoms and optimize symptom relief. But just like with the Depolupron, this one can also cause those symptoms of menopause as well as decreased bone density. The brand name that we have, or actually this is not the brand name, this is actually the, the name of the drug, is called Elagalix. The brand name is Oralissa, so you might see that in the medical or, or magazines that you might see the advertisements for it. Now there's another class of medications called aromatase inhibitors. To be honest with you, I don't really use this too often for endometriosis. I use it for other things. In the OBGYN field, we use it as adjunctive treatment, for example, for women who have breast cancer, because again, it downregulates our production of estrogen. What it does is it turns off this enzyme called aromatase. We have this enzyme that's mostly sitting sort of in the fat, fatty tissue of our abdomen, and aromatase converts male hormone, women make a little bit of male hormone, and it converts that hormone into estrogen. So basically it gets rid of that source of estrogen that our body makes. Um, in terms of endometriosis, it is considered an off-label use. So typically, again, we usually use this as an adjunctive treatment for breast cancer. And it actually, it actually is used also for the treatment of infertility for women who are not ovulating. This, the main side effect of this is, is with the Elagalix and the Depolupron are bone loss. In the typical ones that we do, we would use are anastrozole and letrozole. So now to get to the, the more definitive treatment. So surgery, unfortunately, is where a lot of women end up going if the other treatments don't work. So the, through the surgery, we can actually look at the implants. If they're safe to remove, we can resect them. We can also ablate them, which is to, to kind of use an electrosurgical unit to, to destroy the implants. The other benefit of doing surgery is at the time of surgery, you can get biopsy of these implants again to confirm the diagnosis. And the invasiveness or the severity of surgery can also vary. So from less invasive to more invasive less invasive or conservative way to surgic surgically treat a patient is, uh, again, to remove or ablate any implants. The one thing I have to say, though, is the implants have to be where they're safe to ablate. So if the implant is on bowel or on sensitive tissues like near blood vessels, well, certainly it's not a safe area to re necessarily resect or ablate those structures. If there is an endometrioma present, then yes, we would do what's called a cystectomy, which is to peel back or open up that ovary to remove that cyst. For women who may be done with childbearing or just want that ovary removed, sometimes we just remove the ovary with the cyst in it. With these surgeries, like we mentioned earlier, one of the things that happens with endometriosis is, is scar formation, diffuse scar formation. So one of the things that we do do is we try to break up the scar. Unfortunately though, surgery is a double-edged sword. Whenever you do surgery, it does cause scar formation. So we wouldn't do it just to lice adhesions, but if we happen to be there for any other reason, then we will do so. Now the most definitive therapy is actually a hysterectomy. So basically to remove the uterus and possibly to remove the ovaries as well.
So that's why the age of a woman is important. If they're towards the end of their reproductive years and they have no longer have any desire to have children or they're close to menopause, then hysterectomy with removal of the ovaries would be an ideal treatment. Of note, a reason I have an asterisk next to endometrioma is one of the things that we found is if we try to resect an endometrioma, remove it, you can actually destroy some of the follicles. Now, as women, we are, our ovaries contain all of the follicles or eggs we're ever gonna have. We don't make new ones. When we're born, we have about half a million and then we lose a handful every month once your menstrual cycle starts. So that's why, that's why we end up with menopause, we run out of eggs. So for, especially for patients that want to still conceive or, or being treated for fertility, you want to protect those eggs. So unless an endometrioma is causing severe symptoms or they're very large, for example, greater than five centimeters, there's potentially a benefit to just leaving it alone. So the endometriosis implants are basically endometrial tissue that are just outside of the uterine cavity. And as we know, endometrial tissue inside the cavity can turn into cancer. It can turn into or can develop endometrial cancer. And it's actually a cancer that is fed by or develops from estrogen, our own estrogen production. So excessive estrogen production without that concomitant progesterone production can cause the, our endometrium, our natural, our normal endometrium in the cavity to become what we call hyperplastic. The cells can become atypical, and that's what develops the cancer. So some studies have shown that the implants can also undergo the same process, but we're not 100% sure about the, the significance of this. So I do believe it's something that we need to do larger studies on, but I'm gonna say that it, they probably have the same potential to do so. I think one of the things that limits it though is the endometriosis implants differ slightly from our own endometrial tissue in that they become more fibrotic and filled more with sort of inflammatory immune materials. So for example, they have a lot of macrophages, these implants do. And macrophages are our immune system sort of garbage truck cells. They eat up other cells that are abnormal. So, so the composition of these implants do change, and sometimes instead of becoming or remaining as active tissue, they can be mostly scar and blood, yeah. Well, after your surgery, after your last ovary was removed, your physician said that implants can still, can still remain. Yeah, so that's a good point. The majority of cases of endometriosis we know occur in women who are, who are in their reproductive years. So from, you know, menarche or when your periods start to menopause. <laughs> <laughs> and oftentimes the symptoms do improve or even resolve uh, when menopause occurs. But a small percentage of patients with endometriosis are prepubertal, so young girls who haven't even started menstruating yet, and also women who are postmenopausal. My, my thinking behind it is even though the ovaries are gone, we could still be producing estrogen through the aromatase enzyme in our adipose tissue. So that fun bit of tissue we have in the front that we're always working on trying to lose both men and women, that has that enzyme. It can actually convert male hormone, testosterone, even though we don't make very much, into estrogen. And potentially then that estrogen can, can cause implants to remain. That's one theory behind it. So one of the things I came across my readings is, especially with the multipotent cells theory is, and the retrograde menstruation theory, is that there might be other factors, genetic factors, not specifically a mutation on a single gene that we can identify, but multiple genetic factors that might predispose us to developing endometriosis. So dysmenorrhea is just a general term we have for painful periods. So you can have dysmenorrhea even if you don't have endometriosis or in the process of shedding our endometrial lining, our uterus will naturally cramp, we'll release inflammatory markers, we'll, we'll make a chemical called prostaglandin, which causes the cramping and also activates pain receptors. So so the endometriosis that's not inside our uterus can cause the same, the same pain. So absolutely, they are connected. 
Absolutely. If you do have a, a younger person, a younger woman in your family that's having issues with their periods or missing school, uh, ibuprofen is not working, well, absolutely bring them to bring them to a gynecologist. I agree.